Okay, welcome everybody to Patient Stream and to New Patient School. We'll go ahead and minimize this window. Let's get started. Welcome to everybody. Welcome everybody to patient to a new patient school powered by patient stream. I'm a little rusty. I mean, we haven't done this in now in a couple of weeks because of uh, Christmas, then New Year's, but I'm really excited to be back with you guys today. And especially for the topic. And the reason that we uh, that we came together with this topic is because three weeks ago, um, we were doing a live report of findings. And at the end, it, 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 we we and in that live report of findings, we basically followed the example of a niche where uh, in the identified niche, which was regenerative medicine, and uh, I think we were doing a knee, okay, so knee uh, osteoarthritis in the knee. In that example, Dr. Wells, who uh, I'll introduce here in just a moment, uh, used a regenerative medicine approach that is actually covered by insurance. And there was a lot of intrigue in the training itself and then people reaching out. Uh, and obviously we kind of went in again into that dead zone of the next two weeks due to the holidays. And so today's training is 100% dedicated to uh, that little loop that Dr. Wells opened up. And it's all about how to, how to add insurance covered regenerative medicine into your practice. Okay. And before we get started, again, this is new patient stream, and I want to walk you through what our objective is, why you're here, why we even do these trainings, and what we're all about, okay? Our goal is to help docs grow their practices by providing the only software that allows you, okay, this is DIY, you to run niche-specific marketing campaigns in your practice, okay? If you're a member of patient stream, you already know this. If you're watching this training, we want to take the power and the control and transfer it from an agency into your hands by using patient stream. That's what it's all about. Okay. We want to provide training on the most effective and relevant, by the way. I mean, uh, we could be talking about uh, regenerative medicine a year ago, and we're not talking about what we're going to be sharing today. So training on the most effective and relevant methods to increase new patients and the conversions in your practice Okay, we don't talk about much things other if it has nothing to do with new patients, we're not talking about it here on this on this uh, training. Okay, plus a community of docs uh, with the same drive and passion to get more new patients. Um, if you're here, then you are motivated to learn what's happening now, how to get more new patients in your practice. And again, there's a lot of things that can that can become complicated in the new patient game. I've been in the new patient game for five years between uh, coaching clinics, then transitioning into the actual marketing game itself. And I know how complicated it can be, it can seem, but we want to make it so easy that even this dumb dodo bird right here uh, can do it. Okay. And uh, like I said, uh, if you've been to any of our trainings, excuse me, uh, you know, Dr. Andrew Wells, if this is your first time, here or watching one of these trainings uh, in post as, as far as a replay, uh, let me introduce my buddy, Dr. Andrew Wells. Uh, he is, first of all, he's an awesome, awesome dude. Um, he's the owner, owner of Simplified Integration. And what that does is basically in the title, instead of integrating in a very complex and complicated and costly way, he has a way, a system of integrating practices that is way more simplified. It cuts out the fat. It does it the right way, the faster way. And I mean, it's way, way, way more cost effective than what, what uh, the comparison, uh, the competition is doing out there. So simplified integration. He also has his, a simplified integration podcast, which Shocker talks about, you know, integrating your practice. Uh, running your practice, new patient marketing, everything that he's going to share in this training plus other trainings he does, I'm sure you're talking about in some form or fashion on your podcast, correct, Dr. Wells? That's it. That's right. Yep. Cool. And then um, last and certainly not least, this is something that uh, he and I uh, share is a love and a commitment to our families. Uh, he is a husband, father, um, and he really cares too about his practice coach. I would say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 40 and I find myself like with the same drive and passion to, to work and help people, but I'm also making sure that all of those things 
are in balance with that family. And I know Dr. Wells is there as well. He's got a lovely wife and two strapping, young, cute boys. And uh, so anyway, he's a good guy. He's a good friend of mine. And with that, Dr. Wells, I'm going to return. I'm going to turn the time over to you to get us started into today's uh, lesson. Thanks, man. Thanks for the introduction. And um, this is a really exciting topic. We got we got into regenerative medicine. Uh, I, I would say a little bit before the big wave happened and yeah. before chiropractors started jumping into it. And I remember, you know, this is probably like seven, six, seven years ago. I remember thinking about regenerative medicine, which I just heard of. Um, in the wake of my my dad uh, dying from complications of a bad knee operation, and that's kind of how I found out about uh, found out about regenerative medicine. And when it first came out, man, I'll be really honest, it seemed like a and it, it, in many cases it was a really sleazy, like sales sales approach to, to selling to selling regenerative medicine. And what I mean by that, it, it's you know it was very often a high ticket. You know, docs were selling it five to ten thousand dollars per injection. We saw a lot of doctors who were very, very much used car salesman type people and their approach to regenerative medicine, meaning that they're promoting it to help every condition under the sun and every type of degenerated joint. And they made these wild claims about what it, what it could do and what it did. And really, uh, I think, gave regenerative medicine a bad, a bad name. And, and so we, we had to operate in that type of environment and we always try to do things ethically and, and do right by patients. But that's sort of how this was, this industry was born in the chiropractic profession and integrated practices. And the question we always had was, well, what happens if insurance starts covering this? Like, are, are we going to still be able to, to offer this? And, you know, if so, what would that look like? And I'm going to cover that today in, the, in this training. And, you know, the nice thing about this, this type of therapy is that there has been just a uh, a huge demand for it. And there's also been a ton of research that's now validating what we've been saying for years. And I've had a lot of conversations with chiropractors who are uh, sort of hesitant to add this to their practice because of the things I just mentioned. And they seem, you know, it seemed to be sort of too good to be true. And they were worried about their practice reputation or getting in trouble for compliance reasons and all, all really valid reasons not to add it. But what you're seeing now is uh, this type of service and therapy uh, start to be covered by insurance. And, uh, and so it, in a lot of ways, that's validating what we've known for years. And it's really bringing regenerative medicine to the mainstream because patients always want to know like, Hey, when is, when is my insurance going to cover this? And we're now at that, uh, at that point in, in this type of therapy. So, um, if you want to uh, click the next slide, thanks, uh, Sam. So there's some similarities between the company Lego and regenerative medicine and if you have kids like me, I, I, there's a photo on the last slide of my two little guys. And I don't know, if Sam, if you can relate to this, but uh, I don't buy a whole lot of Legos because they're insanely expensive, but somehow our house is filled with Legos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Everywhere. Like I sit up and there's one in my butt crack from the couch. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Legos are everywhere. They're everywhere in our house. Yeah. And, and they're, yeah, there's always a loose Lego somewhere. Anyway. If, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, it may shock people to know that Lego almost went bankrupt. And when you look at the prices they, they attach to these little plastic blocks, it's like, well, how, that must be an insanely profitable business. But in fact, uh, in 2003, they were $800 million in debt and they were looking at bankruptcy. And they, what, what they found was that they hadn't connected to the demands of their users. And this was a time where kids were really starting to move away from analog toys and more into digital toys and so lego was like hey we're lego we're giants we're going to keep cranking out these plastic blocks and kids are going to play with them and love them forever and they found out that that strategy just didn't work and it wasn't until they started if you notice now that legos uh, a lot of them now have uh, are attached to some sort of other brand like you have your star wars legos and your disney legos and all the all the stuff that kids are seeing on their on their computers and on, on TV and movies. They now uh, have some sort of Lego. In fact, Lego makes movies now and they have, I think their own TV show, but they've entered, they've, they've sort of created a hybrid system where they're entering this digital space and they're connecting with their users now who are my kids age and they want, you know, they, they're, they're very connected to the internet and connected to TVs and movies as much as we hate it. 
Um, it's just a reality. And so Lego uh, had to pivot and they had to create a new business model in order to, to stay relevant and not go out of business. And, you know, today they're now profitable again because they've, they've completely changed their strategy. And the same thing is true with regenerative medicine. So if you flip to the next slide, Sam, let me, now this is just one year ago, two years ago. This is how fast this industry has changed. Back in the day, as I say it in, in regenerative medicine, we would do some Facebook ads and newspaper ads. We'd send people to a, a seminar where we do group education. We'd sell injections for four or 5k an injection. That was always a cash service. And let's say we had on a decent month, we'd have 10 patients come in at about three and a half thousand dollars in profit for pay, per patient. We were making, we we're profiting about 35 grand a month in regenerative medicine. Sometimes we do double that, triple that. It was a huge uh, cash generator for our practice. And we did that for years and did really well with it. And we always had this question in the back of our head, well, what happens if insurance starts covering this? Because we know that insurance isn't going to pay five or six or $7,000 per injection. And we're now at that point. So uh, if you can click to the next slide, Sam. So this was uh, the, the question we always got from patients. Uh, most patients is, well, does my insurance cover it? And our answer was always, no, it doesn't cover it. And the next question would be, well, when will my insurance cover it? And we'd always say, well, we have no idea. We know it's coming, but we don't know if it's going to be a year, 10 years or, or never. Um, but that's now here. So this is solving a lot of issues, but it also creates some new problems that we didn't have a year ago or two years ago. So Sam, if you can click to the, the next slide. So here are some advantages. So when, when private insurance covers regenerative medicine and Medicare covers it, here are the advantages. Number one, it's much easier to convert patients because again, it's, a, it, it's less out-of-pocket cost for the patient. It's a much easier sales process. You don't have to go through the whole seminar and education process. It's a whole lot easier to advertise for uh, versus ads that say, you know, if it says like it's not covered by insurance or if you can't say on the ad it's, it's uh, covered by insurance or not covered by Medicare, it makes it tougher to advertise for. And then there's also like we talked about before, this perceived legitimacy, like how legit is this? And, you know, sometimes when patients would say, well, you know, why isn't it covered by insurance? Does that mean it doesn't work? Or does that mean it's an unsafe product? They always had these questions and skepticism because their insurance didn't cover it. Now that it does, it makes it seem like, even though it's the exact same procedure, it makes it seem like it's more valuable and safer and more legitimate than, than it was just a year ago. Now, here are the disadvantages. Number one is that there are lower profit margins because now insurance and Medicare are controlling what they pay doctors for the same injection. And then med uh, medical doctors, DOs have now jumped on the bandwagon. And I've worked with hundreds of medical doctors over the years and the, they always wanna know two things. What, what is the therapy and is it covered by insurance? That's all they care about. <laughs> and then also how much do they make on the procedure? Now that it's covered by insurance, what you're seeing is that for the, for the same reasons on the left side of the screen, all the advantages, medical doctors are jumping on board because they see it as a legitimate service to offer patients that they can just integrate and plug right into their, their existing practices. So now what we're getting is now you don't have competition from just other chiropractors. You have competition from other chiropractors and medical doctors and orthopedic surgeons and all the other uh, practitioners who specialize in joint pain in your community. So what you're seeing is a somewhat of a commoditization of this product. It's become uh, something that anybody could offer. And it doesn't like years ago, like the sort of the sales pitch was, well, use our clinic because we have the best product and we have the best type. We have, we're the most skilled injectors or we do more of these injections than anybody else. And it's, it's, you can't make those claims anymore. There's no differentiation anymore between what you're offering or potentially offering and what another doctor is offering. It's all the same. So you're getting across the board increased uh, competition from other doctors who are offering this type of service. So here, here's where we are with re regenerative medicine now is that uh, it's a somewhat different sales process. So you're doing Facebook ads or newspaper ads or television ads, you have your marketing component, but instead of doing seminars, you're doing direct to office visits. Now, the reason we're not doing seminars anymore, number one, for COVID reasons, but number two, because these services are in many cases covered by insurance. You don't have to go through this like really uh, intricate uh, and sophisticated seminar or sales process to educate, excuse me, to educate the patient before uh, you talk about the service. Now I'll show you some EOBs in just a minute, but 
Um, on average, you'll see about 3000 bucks in reimbursement if you're billing it to insurance. Now I put these little three asterisks there because that can depend widely based on the, the plan your patient has, whether or not that plan covers regenerative medicine. It depends on if you're doing it through Medicare or through private insurance. And so that number will, uh, it depends on how many CCs of, of amniotic tissue you're using. So that number will go up and down. So don't, don't hold me to that number, but on average, you're seeing about 3K in reimbursement. Um, if you're paying about 2000 bucks for the actual product itself, uh, you're getting about a thousand bucks in profit. So if you take that same 10 patients at a thousand bucks of profit per month, you're making about 10K in profit with that same, uh, that same patient base. And so we went from the example of $35,000 in profit a month to about $10,000 in profit a month uh, in profit per month. But you have to consider if you're doing this as a medical service, you have other overhead, you have your supervising medical physician, you may have a nurse practitioner, you have increased overhead because of your medical malpractice. Um, so there, there's some other costs associated with, with maintaining those patients. So what we're seeing across the US is that doctors who are, who are uh, used to doing this cash model or in this position, we're like, well, do I really want to do this anymore? Is it worth the extra five, 10, 15,000 bucks a month to stay in regenerative medicine, knowing that it's becoming more and more competitive? So that's the question where most doctors find themselves. Uh, and a lot of doctors have really moved away from regenerative medicine because of this. It's just not, they can do other things that are more profitable than regenerative medicine. I'm not saying that it's not profitable anymore, but what I am saying is that the strategy, the overall strategy has to shift in order to stay relevant if you're going to do regenerative medicine. So in this model, it really becomes more of a volume play than it does, uh, you know, a small, uh, a small volume type practice. So this is an example of an EOB. This is a Blue Cross Blue Shield patient in Texas. Um, that little red arrow points to the amount paid. So in this case, this is a pretty high uh, value case, Blue Cross Blue Shield. In this instance, this was for a 2cc injection. Uh, and in Blue Cross Blue Shield paid about 4,800 bucks to the doctor for that injection. Uh, and then you're paying about 2,000 bucks for the actual product, which is fairly standard in the industry. So this person made, this doc made about 3,000 bucks on this injection, roughly. Uh, this is a Medicare EOB for the same product. And I'm gonna talk about Medicare in just a minute because this is one I think uh, requires some caution. But Medicare, and I've seen lots and lots of Medicare EOBs for a two cc injection, you're looking at about 3,200 bucks, 3,300 bucks roughly paid to the doctor for, uh, for a two cc injection. So there, um, so we're, what we're seeing is that, you know, this is relatively new. We've seen these EOBs come in for the last couple of years. Um, and I've seen a lot of those, but I just wanted to give you, I wanted to show you that yes, doctors are actually getting paid for this product. Now, there's a shift that's happening right now. The market is shifting away from chiropractors and they're moving toward medical doctors. And I, I don't mean this in a bad way. And so please don't, um, uh, you know, please don't get offended if I, if I say this, but if you're a patient and you have the choice between going to a chiropractic integrated office versus a, an orthopedic office or a pain management clinic, what do you think that, that patient is going to choose? In most cases, they're going to choose the MD route. Not to say that your office doesn't have a medical doctor or medical staff, but the perceived value always goes toward the, the, the medical clinic that does this stuff on a daily basis and is not doing like chiropractic work or, or functional medicine work. That's typically where, where patients go. So, the, and the reason this is happening is that now that this stuff is being covered by insurance, is it, it's very easy for medical doctors, like I mentioned before, to start plugging this therapy into their existing system. So Sam, if, you, if you'll click to the next slide. So here's what MDs are doing. Now, remember, if you're making like a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks per injection, that's not a whole heap of money. It's not extremely lucrative, but what they're doing is that medical doctors have other services that they're offering patients. So it's oftentimes not that they're leading with regenerative medicine. Oftentimes they're leading with medications, steroid injections, hyaluronic acid injections. They're doing physical therapy. They're doing nerve blocks, radio frequency ablations. Uh, they're doing surgeries. And what they're doing is they're, they're plugging regenerative medicine in this existing system as another service to potentially offer. So what they do is they, they take patients up this value ladder of services you know, so for example, if the medications don't work, 
as you guys know, they'll offer steroid injections. If the steroid injections wear off, maybe they'll do uh, hyaluronic acid, or that's may maybe when they'll, they'll introduce regenerative medicine. But what they're doing here is they're, the overall value of the case is, is much more lucrative than just a $1,500 regenerative medicine injection. So the strategy is, so it's much easier for medical doctors to profit from this because number one, they have all these other services they can offer that same patient, but they also have a much higher new patient uh, stream and patient base in a traditional chiropractic office. So if you go to your interventional pain doc or your orthopedic doc, they have a constant flow of referral patients that they can plug these types of therapies into. So it makes it much harder for chiropractors to compete because they're offering the same thing, but they don't have all the other added therapies and, and services that, that the medical doctor has. Um, so what chiropractors have done in uh, recent times, and this is, uh, you, can, you can skip to the next slide, Sam, thank you, is that chiropractors have started to offer other therapies, just like the medical doctors do. So you see a lot of docs that are offering regenerative medicine also do HA injections, they do bracing, uh, they do decompression, which is a cash therapy. Uh, we, teach, we teach our clients and doctors how to do physical therapy. So uh, what we're finding is that having an actual physical therapist in your practice is a great way to add a revenue stream to your practice and patients who have knee pain and back pain and shoulder pain. Um, but my point is, is that if you're, if you're relying on regenerative medicine as a standalone therapy, it's not going to work very well long-term. You have to have other therapies like chiropractic care, other services that you can offer your patient. It's going to benefit the patient, but also is another revenue stream uh, for, for, uh, for your clinic. Cool. Uh, and Sam, if you want to skip to the next slide. So there are, now here's what, um, I've been in this industry for a while and I would put myself very much in the conservative side. When this first came out a couple of years ago, we started hearing of doctors starting to get reimbursement for regenerative medicine. And what I'll tell you is that there is a whole, there's a ton of fraud that happens with, with this, in this environment. So for example, when this first came out, there was a company, I'm not going to name names, but there was a company saying, yeah, we're getting four or $5,000 for, for, there's this Q code that you can use for regenerative medicine. And the Q code was actually for, uh, it was for wound care. And the code was specifically for people who had wounds, like for, for example, a diabetic patient who had an ulcer. It was for patients who had uh, like wounds that wouldn't heal. And you could use this amniotic product to help wound care. And there was a code for it. It paid really well. So what doctors were doing is they would use the wound care code but the diagnosis code didn't matter. They were injecting it in knees and shoulders and backs, but they were using the code for wound care, which is fraud. It's illegal. And, and so doctors are getting paid on that. And uh, many doctors got in trouble for that. There are doctors who are still doing it. And what you're seeing is that there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of really bad vendors and bad uh, consultants who have jumped on this bandwagon and are giving doctors awful advice, illegal advice, in the hopes of selling more products. So now listen, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a, a billing specialist, but here's what I do. If you wanna do something new in your practice, you'll say, hey, I wanna, I wanna bill regenerative medicine uh, to insurance. The first thing you should do is hire a healthcare attorney. They don't cost a lot of money. I mean, you can, you can spend an attorney 500 bucks to review a therapy and a code for you. And you can give the, uh, the healthcare attorney who's an expert in the legal and the legalities of these types of therapies and get their opinion. And if the attorney says, hey, you know what? This looks completely above board and you should do it. it, looks legal. And if it helps your patient go for it, then do it. And if they say, hey, listen, this code doesn't match what you're using it for. This is illegal. Then obviously you don't do it. And this is where most doctors, they skip this step. And what I find is that a lot of, of doctors are blindly following vendor recommendations. And obviously like what, what is the, the goal of a vendor? It's, it's to sell more products. And there are a ton of vendors, I've seen this time and time again, that give doctors bad advice because they wanna sell more products. And the doctor, it's the doctor's fault because they didn't take the time and the effort and the resources to do the research necessary to find out whether or not that service was legal and viable. So what I'm telling you is that, and this is true for regenerative medicine, this is true if you wanna add a physical therapist to your practice, or if you wanna start giving out knee braces, whatever it is. If you're going to bill something to Medicare or bill something to private insurance, make sure that you take the step, simple step to, to contact a healthcare attorney, get a green light or a red light, and then proceed from there. 
because I don't know if you're like me, I like to sleep at night and I like to rely on experts who know the legalities of these types of services just before blindly following somebody's, uh, somebody's advice. Uh, here's another piece of advice. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you get emails and promotions from, uh, from vendors or people trying to sell you stuff and they seem sleazy, guess what? They are. <laughs> and I, I, I see these ads all over and over again. I'm like, man, do people actually trust that guy? And you guys know who I'm talking about. There's so, so many people who are just like, you can tell they're just in it to make a quick buck. And so, you know, do your research on the people who you're following. If it sounds too good to be true, it's probably true. Yeah. Um, as well. So it, make sure that whoever, so the billing, the billing component, if you're going to bill regenerative medicine to insurance, make sure that the person who's doing your billing knows what they're talking about. Now, the thing that piqued my interest initially with, with billing this to private insurance is that with Blue Cross and Blue Shield and United and Aetna, they have a prior authorization process. So what you can do is if you have a patient that you want to inject amniotic tissue into for an osteoarthritic knee, you can take that patient's um, health information and then you can do what's called a prior authorization. So you submit the diagnosis and you su submit the code and the insurance company will tell you whether or not they're going to cover that code based on the information you gave them. So you have to prove medical necessity and you have to prove that the therapy you're offering matches the patient's diagnosis. And guess what? The insurance company will tell you in advance, yeah, we'll pay for that. Or they'll say, you know what? We're not going to pay for that. So then you can, you know, th that becomes in a cash patient. So you have, there's a system in place for private insurance that will tell you whether or not you're gonna get paid on a, on a specific service. And this is not true with just amniotic products. This is true with knee braces. It's true with chiropractic care in some cases or physical therapy. So the, there, are, there are systems in place to, that will tell you whether or not what you're recommending is appropriate for the patient. The insurance company will tell you that. So this gets rid of a lot of like clawback issues that you're seeing where doctors inappropriately, inappropriately use codes for patients and then the insurance company comes back later couple of years down the road and ask for all that money back. Well, in this case, you actually have a, you know, you, you get the green light from the insurance companies. Now, this is different with Medicare. So this, this creates a lot of confusion with doctors. Now with Medicare, under, understand that amniotic products and regenerative medicine is not FDA approved for orthopedic purposes. And that's important. Similarly, there's not, if you're not familiar with what, what are called LCD and NCD guidelines. So Medicare as a national organization, as a federal organization has what are called NCD guidelines or, or national coverage determination guidelines. And these are written guidelines that you can research and look up on Medicare's website. And they'll tell you whether or not a specific code has written billing guidelines. And the billing guidelines will tell you exactly what that specific product is used for and how to bill for it. Now, if Medicare as a national, on a national level says, you know, they, if they don't have that information, sometimes on a local level, so you have your local contractors, your MACs, your, which will create their own LCD or local coverage determination guidelines. And sometimes a local uh, Medicare contractor will have a guideline for a specific product, such as Amnio, that'll tell you what it's used for and what, you know, how to appropriately bill for it. The problem with amniotic uh, therapy for Medicare is that I, I don't know of, and I may be wrong, but I have not, I've yet to see any written LCD or NCD guidelines for amniotic products for orthopedic purposes. So what I'm saying here is that Medicare, as of now, does not have any written guidelines for how to bill it appropriately. Now, I just showed you a few slides ago that Medicare is paying, right? I showed you an EOB where the doctor has paid about 3,200 bucks from Medicare for, for a patient for an amniotic injection. Now understand this, that Medicare has what is considered a pay first, ask questions later uh, um, policy. So just because you get paid by Medicare for a specific service doesn't mean that that service was billed appropriately. And in my opinion, and I may be 100% wrong on this, but in my opinion, this is a really, really uh, juicy, low hanging fruit for third-party auditors to go after doctors for. So let's say you did uh, 100, uh, 100 injections and you got paid 3,000 bucks per injection for Medicare and you made, what is that, like $300,000? And then two years later, Medicare says, well, you know what? We didn't think that that was medically necessary and we want all that money back. Oh, and by the way, 
uh, we want, uh, we want, we're going to charge penalties to that as well. And uh, that happens more times than you, you <laughs> than we'd like to admit. And, uh, and so this is what we're, I, I think we're already seeing that. And I think we're going to, we may see that in the future. And again, I may be a hundred percent wrong. Medicare may say, you know what, this is totally appropriate and doctors should be using it for orthopedic purposes. But again, there are no written guidelines that we can go off of to say specifically whether or not this is appropriate to start billing patients for. So my, uh, the lesson here is you can, you can, do, if you're going to do it, number one, make sure that you have the approval of a healthcare attorney that says it's appropriate to do so because then you're relying on legal advice. And, uh, but I would just, I would tread cautiously. When you're looking at private insurance, your Blue Cross Blue Shields, United, Aetna's of the world, um, make sure that you have a prior authorization process in place before you start billing this to insurance to make sure that you're protecting yourself from a financial standpoint. So uh, my, my big lesson here is that oftentimes vendors and, and consultants will, will throw up EOBs just like I did. Don't use EOBs as proof of compliance. Again, just because an insurance company or Medicare paid it doesn't mean that it was used appropriately. And, and I've just, I've been, I've been in this industry long enough to see so many uh, bad actors and so many people making mistakes, not because they were trying to intentionally scam the system, but doctors just didn't know and they didn't know the rules and they didn't do their research uh, uh, and do their due diligence before they started offering these services to patients. So um, I hope this is helpful. So this, it, you know, it may be a little bit vague and I'm not, again, I'm not an attorney. I'm not a healthcare com compliance officer. I'm not a billing expert. And so I can't offer that type of advice, but I can tell you uh, what I know and what I've experienced over the years uh, in this industry. So if you're listening to this, you, you may fall into three categories. Number one, you may be on here and, and you're just kind of curious about how regenerative medicine works. And you're like, hey, uh, thanks for the info, but I never plan on doing a regenerative medicine. That's cool. Some of you on here may be, um, you, maybe you're doing regenerative medicine now and maybe you're having uh, trouble moving from the cash game into the insurance game and you want help. Um, and that's something that we can definitely help you with. And then you may be on here like, hey, just give me the dang code, man. I want the code. <laughs> now, I don't give out codes on training uh, seminars like this. And let me explain why. And so before you get angry at me, if, and, and please don't take this the wrong way, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way, but if you knew how to use these codes properly, you would know how to research and find the code on your own. And so what I don't want to do is throw up a code and say, yeah, here's the code for arthritis and amniotic tissue and uh, build that code to, to insurance and Medicare and you'll be fine. Uh, that would be doing you a massive disservice and putting a lot of doctors at risk. And I know a lot of doctors who would be uh, more than happy to do that. And I, I just don't think that it's fair to you or fair to anyone listening who doesn't know the rules. Um, if you want to know the rules and you want to get into regenerative medicine or you want to move from the cash game into the insurance game, we have a ton of amazing resources and legal help and billing help and great vendors to help you through that process so that you can offer your patients a valuable service, make money in the process, and then also help you do it legally and ethically. So if this is something you're interested in, um, what you can do is go, this is a, uh, a link to my calendar. And actually, I'll, um, Sam, if it's okay, can I just paste it into the chat box. Yeah. So if you, um, let me make sure I've got it here. Yeah. So if you go to the chat box, I think from the chat box, you can copy and paste. Um, just yes, use the copy yeah. and paste function and then just plug that into your web browser. Um, I have got my calendar listed on, uh, on that link. Pick a time that works for you. If you're interested or have questions, I'll be happy to jump on a 10, 15 minute call with you and answer any qu specific questions that you have or help guide you in the right direction if you need help in this, uh, in this arena. Um, this calendar will be up for, um, oh, it says, Heather says, I can't see it. Oh, it was posted to panelists. Sorry, let me do this one more time. Thanks, Heather. <clears throat> there you go. And as soon as, uh, as soon as we get done here, oh, well, I, I, we're, we're, I think we're about ready to field some questions. And I would love to get some questions from you guys. I have some of my own thoughts uh, on this. In fact, um, I personally have been in, I mean, if, if you've come to any of these trainings and you know me, you know, or you know my backstory, I didn't start out as a marketer. I actually started out as a clinic consultant. I worked with a doctor named Dr. Sonny Gill. 
Um, and I worked in practices and I was, I mean, he was always, he's, he's very similar to you, uh, Andrew, where he loves new opportunities, but at the same time, uh, he has seen clinics get bit. And when you get bit through audit, and by the way, getting audit is just kind of like, I mean, they're going to find something, you know, they got to bite you for something. Um, he's just seen way too many things. So when I heard about these, these different groups doing these, these things, I'm like, uh. in fact, I had a, a regenerative uh, medicine company come to me last year and say, Hey, uh, we know you've got a big audience. Can you start selling this for us? I'm like, and they, they gave me the Q codes. They gave me all this stuff. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> and I think I sent it to you and Sonny like a year ago. I'm like, what do you think about this? And both of you were like, no. So here, I guess here is, uh, if, if this has been a little bit of a letdown to you, I gotcha. Don't worry about it. I have been operating under, under this assumption for a very long time as far from a, from a perspective of, whoop, from a perspective of, let me go ahead and put that back. From a perspective of, uh, when anything is, uh, there's this there's this phrase in sales and marketing called a tactic known as a tactic blown, right? And that's the way everything everything goes. Like at some point, something is no longer, uh, you know, is no longer new. It becomes commoditized. If it's any good, which you guys are all here to offer awesome services. So if it's any good, it will eventually be adopted wide scale as regenerative therapies are big. So that's good, a good thing. So this is why whenever you look in patient stream, in patient stream, whenever I'm making an offer, okay, whenever I'm getting, and let me say it this way, whenever I'm uh, trying to architect qualified attention, okay, qualified attention, I'm trying to do it in a way that is not being prolific in the marketplace, Okay, I'm trying to create niches because I mean, if, again, a sales term, the niches are in or the riches are in the niches. Okay. And so when I look at uh, a protocol like you're looking at here, I'm seeing something that is called a knee restore protocol. I'm promoting knee restoration and regenerative medicine isn't the hero of this protocol. Regenerative medicine is one of the uh, is one of the participants in the protocol, right? And so um, what I love about what I love about all of my different clients is learning their approach to solving these problems. And while they are there, there may be very many similar approaches, like I love blueprints, uh, Dr. Gum's approach to, uh, you know, knee pain, he's got an awesome approach. And a lot of the docs do that, but they also add their little flavor into it and do what they know work, right? And the same thing goes with you, Dr. Wells. You know, this is a this is you know visco supplementation protocol as well as DME. Um, those are I think a lot of people know about those, but nobody's talking about that bottom right hand corner uh, knee decompression. You want to know how easy it is to get people to come in and try knee decompression when they see what it does. Getting new patients and and growing your practice is is an attention game. Like how can you get their attention? So. If on the one side, if any of your, if there was any deflation in what was, you know, in what you learned today, I would think you're looking at this through the entirely wrong perspective. I would think, hey, I can get ahead of the curve and create my own knee restore program. Or in speaking with Dr. Wells, I can create my own strategy because the reality is, is the reason why I love working with so many doctors is because they all have their own subjective approach to treating the problem. And as long as you're getting amazing results, which we see so many people who do, then you're in good company. You're going to be just fine. But if you're a one hit wonder, uh, I, I mean, I remember what it was like marketing for stem cell, uh, for stem cell clinics. The people, some people, I remember one clinic I had, they didn't even know what stem cell was. And, and they were offering PRP. I said, well, why aren't you offering stem cell uh, injections? That's what we were calling it back then. Nobody, yeah. nobody was talking about amniotic allograft or anything like that. And they said, well, what is that? I'm like, whoa, you're doing PRP and you don't know what the other 
types of regenerative injections are? Well, now everybody knows about it, right? And so it's not a game of, uh, it's not a game of, hey, how can I make money by doing one injection? It's about how can I provide the most end benefit and, and the best outcome for my patients? Because here's what you have playing for you too. Dr. Wells talked about the MD's uh, mental approach to this. So that means that, okay, they are, they'll do an injection, but are they going to do uh, any of these therapies? No. If you go into an osteoarthritis, into an orthopedic surgeon's clinic, what's their goal? Surgeons cut. That's what they want to do. So they may offer regenerative therapies as an option, but they want to cut. That's where they make their profit. So understand that just because there's wide adoption, there's always a place for niche solutions that get good outcomes, right? Yeah. And Sam, I want to take it one step further and, and a little bit, um, I'm going to play devil's advocate here a little bit too, because I think a lot of chiropractors are, are used to the, the concept of niches. And I actually did a podcast not too long ago saying that the riches are not in the niches. And, mm. and here, here's, here's what I mean by this is that chiropractors are used to bouncing from therapy to therapy to therapy to therapy. So it's like, there's like the decompression wave and then there is the the functional medicine wave, and then there's the, the regenerative medicine wave. And then like all these different niches that, that chiropractors will bounce from, you know, uh, you know, one thing gets really hot in the industry and then everybody jumps on it. And then you have to find a new, a new niche to jump into. Now, niches are fantastic to market to, uh, and to market to patients, right? It's a, it's a great marketing tool, but here's what, here's what we want to do is we want to take doctors from the niches to stable, centers of excellence. So the, the real, the real stability and the real profitability from a business standpoint is a clinic that, that can sustain those, those, um, those changes in, in, uh, um, in trends. And so if you can have like, just imagine if you're billing a hundred thousand dollars from chiropractic, you have, let's say $150,000 from physical therapy. You have, uh, a, a nutrition, like a functional medicine program is pulling in a hundred thousand a year. And then you have a knee restore program that's doing a hundred thousand a year. Yeah. And you start to add up these little therapies um, that are, that aren't perceived as wacky to patients. You know, these are normal, like patients want chiropractic. They want PT, they want nutrition help. Hard to market for those things, right? Like you want, you want the sexy new tool and gizmo and gadget that will get things, you know, will fix the yeah. patient problem. But we, what we really want to do is from a long-term perspective is take our clients from from the niche marketing into stable uh viable long-term businesses that they can rely on yeah so I'm not saying niches are bad I, you know in fact if we if we can find a way to like market a new a new niche or a new tool or get like that in the beginning of this training you showed that uh that new device that dr wilner uses like that is a fantastic way to get new patients in the practice right, right. medical doctors do the same thing but we have to have a, a really um, more sophisticated suite of therapies and options that we can take patients through that aren't going to burn the doctor out at the, end, at the end, at the end of the day. Right. So, so as your is maybe, let me, let me deconstruct what you're saying. So you're saying that offering uh, services that, that are, are tailored to niche conditions. So osteoarthritis, right. That's a niche yeah. condition, yeah. right that that type of approach is the right approach, but basing it on any specific type of therapy is not necessarily the play. Is that what you're saying? Right. Right. Okay. Like, so for example, it's like we have a, a drug, drug free surgery, free, a, a brand new drug free surgery, free approach to knee pain. Yeah. Right. So, the, I mean, that could be anything, right? The patient doesn't know what it is, but they know it's not a drug and it's not surgery and that's what they're looking for. Yeah. Um, you know, we've seen the same thing with neuropathy, right? That was a huge, you know, that's been big over the last three or four years. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's not a bad, it's not a bad thing. It's a smart thing to market the niches, but you also, on the back end, at the clinic level, you need to have a more sophisticated system to, um, uh, to pull from once, once the patient is in your office.
Yeah, I agree. Um, it, it's funny because um, I, I did, I wrote an email a little while ago about the root of the word gimmick. You know what the root of the word gimmick is? No. It's magic, right? Okay. And when have you walked down the street and seen somebody doing a magic show and not stopped, right? And so, so I think gimmick has a negative connotation when we use it, um, but magic does not, right? And so what, what we're looking for in magic or, or in marketing is just a little seasoning, a little trickle of magic to get the attention from the niche marketplace. So from people who uh, have knee pain, for example, from people who have knee pain, we want to just use a little bit of magic to, um, you know, to get their attention. And the reality is uh, what, what uh, that device that I showed that I was showing you at the very beginning, um, that thing is amazing. It's, it feels so good. I mean, I've done the, the therapy myself. It's amazing. And it does a really good thing. But man, we are just right now at the very beginning of technology breakthroughs, because that's not using uh, ERT is not using, uh, you know, any type of cell, it's using like an electric frequency and output the same way maybe a pulse wave therapy does or a class four laser. These are like new and I say new, I know a lot of them have been around for now decades, but new to the marketplace, these are new technologies, new therapies, man, there is things that are coming. And those are awesome ways to a provide like better outcomes. That's number one, right? And then B, when you put it in front of the mark, uh, marketplace to have a little bit of magic to, to, you know, command that level of attention. And I think you're totally right. Um, in fact, I, I, you know, I've taught, watch me do videos. I've taught consideration marketing. It's on my YouTube channel, all these things where it's like, Hey, we want direct response marketing. Like, you know, we have tons of those offers in patient stream, but at the same time, that's not the only thing that you should be doing. That's not the only thing I do for my business. I have direct response, but I also have a, a blog. Like I, you know, we write a, a blog. So we have information going all the time. I create videos all the time. I have emails that go out all the time. And so I have consideration pieces, or in other words, education pieces that are going out over time to lay the foundation of credibility, trust and attention. Right. So um, this has been really good. Anything, uh, anything, any questions, I guess, do we have any questions from anybody and anything you want to add, Andrew? Um, yeah, any questions are welcome. And just to summarize, you know, the, the cash, uh, man, and I'll, I used to call it this, but it, this, the word, even the word, you can't use the word stem cell. It's not stem cell therapy. Like that whole industry has, that ship has sailed. And so if you're still trying to, trying to make it in the cash regenerative medicine game, it is done. You're not going to do it. And so if you want, if you need help transitioning to an insurance-based model, we can absolutely help you with that and doing it the right way and give you all the resources you need to do it. It's still a viable therapy. You can still make it profitable and help patients, but the, 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 the playing, the playing uh, surface, the game board is, has changed uh, yeah. completely. So yeah, there is a way to do it. There's a way to do it legally, ethically, profitably in a way that helps patients. And, you know, we look at it, always look at it from three, from, from three points of view. Is it legal and ethical? Does it help the patient? And can we profit from it as a clinic? And if it checks those three boxes, it's, it's game on. And uh, so, yeah, there is still a way to make regenerative medicine possible in your clinic, um, but there are some big, big uh, pitfalls to watch out for.